Hey, my name's Ben Yenny, and I don't make movies. I help filmmakers make money from their movies. A big part of that job is helping filmmakers figure out how to actually raise money in order to make the film in the first place. In order to do that, you generally need the help of investors, and in order to convince those investors to invest in you, you normally need some degree of documentation. That's what this video is about, creating and causing to be created all of the different documents you're going to need in order to have a chance at closing your investors. So without further ado, let's get started. I generally have a comment question. And this week, that comment question is, what movies is your next movie a cross between? It could be something like, it's a cross between Waiting and Little Shop of Horrors without the musical elements. But let's get back to the topic at hand and talk about what this video is actually about. There are generally as many as five different sorts of documents that you're going to need. One is a lookbook, one is a deck, one is a business plan, one is an audience analysis, and then there are pro forma financial statements, which essentially back up the deck and the business plan. A lookbook is something that is visually appealing and is generally meant to convey the artistry and creativity behind your film. It may touch on business briefly, but it is far from its primary purpose. A deck is a snapshot of the business of your film. Unlike a lookbook, its primary purpose is to convey the business as well as give potential investors a snapshot of what your marketing plan is going to be as well as who your audience is and how this thing is going to make money. Lookbook is how the film is going to look when it's done. Deck is how is it going to make money and get these stakeholders their money back. A business plan is a detailed text document that outlines how you will take this idea or script and turn it into a finished product that is out and available for people to buy and watch. Generally, you'll only need the business plan for angel investors in order to make a private placement memorandum, which we'll go over in a little bit. Lookbooks are for pretty much anybody. They're very enjoyable to read, and there's not as strict a formula for them. It's one of the first documents you would ever send to get people to buy into the creative elements of this potential project. A deck is something that you should be able to just let your eyes pass over and get a good idea of the business. Generally, it's pretty early in your talks uh, with an investor. It could be at or directly after your first meeting. Sometimes it will even be spent shortly before your first meeting so that that first meeting can be more productive. While pretty much everybody wants to see a lookbook, fewer people want to see a deck. Studios don't care as much because most of the time they know the business better than you do. This is particularly true for business plans as the studios definitely know this plan a lot better than you as a filmmaker. They make their entire business monetizing films, whereas you as a filmmaker focus primarily on creating them. The big people who need a business plan are angel investors who haven't worked extensively in film before. An executive producer might want to see your business plan, but they're probably going to make a lot of changes to it or if you're working with an executive producer like me from an early stage, I normally help guide the creation of the document to make sure it overcomes the objections that your or my investors are likely. Generally, you'll only see it or send it out after they've already sent out the deck. So the next major question is why do people need a lookbook? Deck or business plan. And the other two documents, or three documents, generally just reinforce the data that you need to make any of these three primary documents. The lookbook is more to give them a good idea 
of the creative elements, as we've mentioned, and the goal of giving it to them is to get them interested enough in your project to request the deck. The reason you give them the deck is to make sure they understand the basics of your business and the goal in giving it to them is to show them how you will be able to get them their money back and get them to take the next step with you. Finally, the goal of the business plan is to show them that you're going to have a clear path to make their investment pay dividends in order to make their investment see profit. Your goal in giving them this document is to show them how you're going to make them their money back and more, as well as convince them that they want to give you their money instead of the huge amount of other things they can do with that money. The business plan often uh, also forms the backbone of the Private Placement Memorandum, or PPM, which again, we'll get into later. Up next, we've got the audience analysis, which again, wasn't on the list of those previous three, but you basically need to do in order to get the data you need to really write the business plan and deck. So in order to write that audience analysis, you need to start with the basic demography. And now those are things like the age range, gender, race, any niche interests. And the place you find that data to start is by going on IMDb and looking at the ratings of films similar to yours as you would do in a comparative analysis which I go over in much more detail in last week's video, which you can also find in a card up here. After you figure out the basic demography, you'll need to analyze their spending power and general buying habits. Part of that is looking into data on the general income of the demographic, as well as what they tend to buy, whether or not they pay to see movies, and where and how they get their entertainment. This can be a little bit difficult to research, but one great place to start is the MPA theme report. After you've figured out their spending power and buying habits, you need to figure out how you can actually access them. And this will also form a lot of your marketing strategy. You need to start with their macro geographic location, then move more into their micro location. A macro geographic location in this instance might be the state of Pennsylvania or the city of Philadelphia. A micro geographic location could be the suburb of Germantown or brewery town, or even a couple of local cafes around here. You should also look into where these people tend to congregate online and what social media platforms they tend to use. If you're, tar if you're making a family film, and targeting uh, young teens and tweens, you probably want to have a strategy for TikTok, as well as Snapchat, as much as it pains me to say that. Another thing you need to understand is whether or not your demographic is underserved. Have there been a lot of movies made specifically for this demographic recently? If so, it could be very hard to compete with that other content. If there haven't been, why not? Are people just not seeing this opportunity? Or is it that they don't actually have the money to buy anything and any film that you make is unlikely to be profitable? You can look at this with a lot of diversity initiatives in film lately. For a long time, many minority communities were completely ignored by film, uh, by large studios, because they assumed that uh, films made specifically for those minority com communities were unlikely to be profitable. Some of this does come down to uh, incorrect analysis of spending power and buying habits, but a lot of that's kind of gone away, especially after the massive success that was Black Panther, as well as the success that was Get Out. And I'll, uh, personally, I think a lot of the reasoning for that is there wasn't really much authentic content being made for these communities. 
the key in today's day and age, more than anything else, is authenticity. And I know that sounds like it's a lot of hooey or BS because I am still trying to monetize this channel. It is not. It really comes down to people want to feel like people understand them when they're watching work created by filmmakers who are targeting them and their community. So as I said a couple slides back, there isn't really a set structure for lookbooks. As such, there also aren't templates. There is both a very defined structure and templates for slide decks. But lookbooks are kind of meant to be more freeform and creative. So here's a list of what needs to be in a lookbook. First, there's the basic project information. You know, things like title, logline, synopsis, and I generally mean short synopsis here. A bit about the characters and a little bit more information on the filmmaker and team. Then there's a little bit more about the creation of the film and the creative aspects of the film. These could be where the inspiration came from. Uh, if it's based on an existing IP, you probably also want to uh, mention what spoke to you as a creator about this IP. IP means intellectual property. That you can list a couple of films that are similar from a creative aspect. You can list uh, films that are similar creatively. They don't have to be as recent as you would for something like a comparative analysis. You just need to give the reader an idea of what you're going for. You can take images that denote the general feel of the film. Sometimes you can actually take these from the creatively similar films themselves. This is a document that is not meant for wide distribution. In fact, you should not be distributing it on a wide basis at all. So the laws around copyright are slightly different. That being said, I am not a lawyer. Talk to your lawyer before doing this. And finally, you can use the color palette, an idea of what colors the film will use most heavily. This is something that it's best to imply more than state outright. Using something like a textured background for your lookbook is a good way to show your color palette without saying it. Palette, 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 palette. Somebody I'm sure is going to call me on it. Oh, and before we move on to the uh, technical and practical swatches, the creative, sim the creatively similar films. This could be something like it's uh, this film meets this film, just like this week's comment question. Drop it down below. And on to the technical and practical swatches. You can list locations you'd like to shoot at. It's better if you have access to them, or if they're in an area with great tax incentives. Same for cities. And while you can list the equipment you plan on using, you should have a good business reason for listing it because most investors just aren't going to care that you're shooting it on the latest Ari Alexa or the latest Red. Nobody cares unless you can say that, oh, we already own one, so we'll be cutting the budget by using this equipment. Or we've already raised this amount of money in soft costs from donated equipment rentals because our director of photography already owns them. That's the right way to phrase that. And finally, you should close it out with some light business information. Things like your ideal cast list and photos. You should state that these are your ideal cast list and photos. And, not Im and say outright that you do not have any commitment from them. This is to give you an idea of the character. Same for director as well as distributor. By the way, if you're going to list your ideal distributors, maybe don't send it to different distributors. That's happened to me more than once. Up next, we have the 12 slides you need in your independent film investment deck. I had this as a video on the channel as soon as I launched my YouTube channel, but uh, there was a weird encoding error which made that video basically unwatchable. 
So I figured I might as well re-record that at the same time as I record the rest of the documents video, which you may or may not be watching. I'll link to that either individual video or the full video in the description. But before we talk about the 12 slides you actually need here, it's important to talk a little bit about why this structure is so important. And a lot of it comes down to the same reason that screenplay format is so particular. When people are reading it, they need to understand that you know what you're doing. They need to be able to have their eye glance down it and just get an idea of what you're going for pretty much immediately without too many second thoughts. If you don't follow this format, there's a good chance your project will end up on the reje reject pile straight off. Same as a script would, because if you don't follow this format, most investors will just assume you don't know what you're doing and they don't have the time to teach you. Many of these investors get just an ungodly amount of decks sent to them every single week. One investor I talked to gets more than 200 a week. So they look for any reason to say no. Don't be that reason. Don't give them the reason. So in addition to these 12 slides, there is one important thing. You're not supposed to put tons of text on this. Really, at most, you want five bullet points with no more than two lines of text per bullet point and 36 point font. You have to be very concise and convey what you're going for in as few words and as few characters as possible. It's tricky, but it can be done. So let's get into the 12 slides you need. Also, by the way, there is a free template for this in both PowerPoint and Keynote in the resource section, which I've linked down below. So the 12 slides you need in your independent film investment deck. Slide zero is project name and artwork. This is just your key art and your project name, maybe something like a film from production company name LLC or an investment opportunity from production company name LLC. Yes, you need to be an LLC. I'm not a lawyer, but you should talk to your lawyer about making you an LLC. And you should talk about your project overview. Max five bullet points, two lines per bullet point, 36 point font. In this slide, the information you want to put out there is a very brief synopsis. You want to put out the genre, the budget, the stage of development, and any marketable attachments. That's it. That's all you have space for. Why does this project need to be made? In a tech deck, this would be a problem slide. What problem? What is the great problem that you're seeking to solve? Why does this film need to be made right now? There are tons of films being made, and most of them don't really solve a problem other than boredom. So you need to convince an investor that this project or this general story must be told and it must be told right now. And then you must convince them that your project and only your project is the one that needs to tell the story. There is no other project that can tell this story anywhere near as well as yours. And that's what you need to convince any investor reading your deck. Up next, we have the opportunity. You can talk a bit about the potential market here. You can also talk about, uh, you can draw from your audience analysis on this. And you more want to lay out the total potential gain. It's similar to the problem solution dynamic of slides two and three. Slide four lays out the opportunity. Slide five focuses on why your film is the only one that can tell that story well. Slide six shows how you'll use your unique competitive advantage to market your film. 
and do it better than anyone else could. This entire document is extremely persuasive. It needs to be because all of these investors have lots of other places they could put their money. Slide seven is distribution strategy. For those of you who don't know, distribution is making your product available for sale. Marketing is convincing people to buy it. You do need both. Slide eight is the competitive analysis. Visually, this slide should just be a bunch of posters from films similar to yours. Unlike the lookbook, this should be films from the last five to seven years so that they more accurately represent the current marketplace for films similar to yours. If you did a comparative analysis, you should have found 20 of these. You don't really need to have 20 on this slide. Five is about right. You don't want to overwhelm and you actually want the slide to be fairly striking. Slide nine is the financials. And this is the one place where it's okay to break the rule of density. You should also have a lot of charts and graphs. You want to do a very top level overview of this budget, of your budget there, excuse me. You also want to do Up next is slide nine, the financial slide. Up next is slide nine, the financial slide. And this slide is about the only place you can really ignore the five bullet points guideline but you should still do it in a very visual way. You'll want to talk a bit about where all the money's coming from. You want to talk a bit about your revenue projections. You want to talk a bit about your total budget and where all the money's going. That gets pretty dense, especially if you're using a lot of charts and graphs, which you should be doing. I'm sorry if you heard anyone run around uh the gorilla rep media best boy my dog is uh running to the backyard i'm gonna see if i can get through the slide though current status just talk about what's going on in any traction you've had recently finally your team you should talk about your core team and focus on the members that investors will find marketable sadly while the director of photography is hugely important to the overall quality of the film, most investors don't quite understand that, so you shouldn't put them on there. Nor should you put on your, I mean, unless they're just way too experienced to be on your budget uh, level and the rest of your crew just pales in comparison, then you might want to consider it. Uh, you also probably don't need to mention your composer. Sorry, it's true. You do want to mention your producers, your director, and this is a great place to talk about any recognizable name talent you already have on board as well. Or your casting director, if they've done a lot, should also be on there. And the final slide is a summary and a thank you. The summary, if there are only, uh, the summary should assume that you have only three things that your investor is going to remember about your project. Those three things need to carry you to getting the next meeting, if not closing the deal. Those three things are what are on the summary, as well as a big thank you, just because it does tend to help. Just to help you all remember this, I do have a free template of this for both Keynote and PowerPoint in the resources section of my site. There's a link to that in the description. Next, we're going to be talking a bit about the sections in a business plan. First is the executive summary, which can be a document unto itself, but is essentially a summary of the remaining sections of the business plan. This format is something I'm still playing with. Uh, I've done a lot of business plans and even wrote a blog series on business planning that followed a different template, which more loosely resembled Louise Levinson's model 
but as I've been working in the field more, I've realized that these are kind of better suited for the current market as Levinson originally laid out that model 15 to 20 years ago. And the market's changed, changed dramatically since then. Section two would be projects, which is talking about your current film or multiple films. Section three is the company and your team. And up till this point, we're pretty closely following Levinson's model. This is where we break. Section four is audience and marketing. Section five is distribution. I actually break them out into separate sections because they are very different. Levinson does not. Also, this is the Gorilla Rep Media Best Boy that I was talking about before, but I'm gonna keep going. Uh, finally, we're going to talk a bit more about the competitive analysis and research. This is your methodology for how you actually do your financials. Uh, this should only be about a page. Um, then your SWOT analysis, that stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And it's different from uh, Levinson in that she just advocates for a risk statement and a risk management section. You should definitely still have a risk statement and you should work with your lawyer to draft that. Then you have the uh, investment plan as well as the financial section. This can be a little bit shorter than it would uh, otherwise because you've covered more of the methodology in your uh, competitive analysis. And I call it both a competitive and a comparison, comparative analysis. There are subtle differences between the two, but for these instances, either work. And finally, the pro forma financial statements, which I think I'm going to have to cover in a separate video because this is, uh, <laughs> you are very distracting. Um, this video is already getting very long, especially with this lovable thing that here. So the last thing we need to talk about are the differences between the business plans and private placement memorandums or PPMs. And the big difference here, and probably the most important, is that the business plan is something that you can draft yourself and a PPM is something that you need the help of a lawyer to draft. And generally they'll work from your business plan as a starting point. The PPM essentially turns your business plan into a security that can be registered with the Edgar database. And while the purpose of a business plan is to educate, the purpose of a PPM is more to form the basis for a security and something that can be accessed by high net worth individuals through, again, the SEC's Edgar database. The only time you really need a business plan is when you're working with a very green angel investor or working with an investment syndicate. And the only reason that you need them for the investment syndicate is the syndicate or a broker working with the syndicate will normally require that you register your PPM with the SEC in the Edgar database just to add some legitimacy to the project. And that's about it, really. Thank you so much for watching this. If you like this content, please like and subscribe to me, uh, Ben Yenny, on my Gorilla Rep Media YouTube channel. But you might also want to subscribe uh, and make this best boy right here. Very happy. His name's Hiccup. And check out some videos below. Also, don't forget the comment question. What movie, uh, what movies are the film you're working on right now, A Cross Between? Thanks so much, and see you next week. Oh. <laughs>